everyone and welcome to the Dell stage on the Noman campus for another fantastic Noman live stream. We didn't practice that at all. Just letting you all know at home. Uh, if you're looking for closed captionings, please head over to our Facebook or our YouTube. Also, we'd like to take a second to thank our sponsors, Dell and NVIDIA. Without them, we wouldn't be able to provide you with such amazing content as you're about to see right now. Now, the people that are here, uh, I, I, got, I got to know them a little bit. And uh, it's always fun when you get to know people that work on stuff that you like, and they're actually really, really cool people. So I'm really excited for you all to know them. But if you're just tuning into the live stream and you don't really know what we're covering today, uh, we're here with Buck. And since 2004, Buck has grown into a global creative company that provides industry-leading 3D animation to diverse clientele such as Sony, Nike, Riot Games, and Netflix. This is really exciting for a lot of you here that are students or some of you that may be watching in some of the labs uh, at the Noman campus here in Hollywood, California, because it really gives you an insight of what else you can do with your skill set that you're learning once you get into this amazing field that we all know and love. So I could stand here and I could rant about my favorite things and why I think that Teemo is absolutely the worst in League of Legends because we just talked about Riot Games and when I ever talk about Riot Games, I gotta bring up how much I hate Teemo. But I'm not gonna do that. Instead, we're gonna hang out with these amazing people right over here. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me introduce Buck. Welcome. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, Thanks to Noman for having us here. Uh, we're really happy to, to be here. Um, I guess I'll introduce myself first. Um, I'm Mark Steinberg. I'm a 3D supervisor at the LA Buck office. Um, I've been uh, at Buck for about seven, almost eight years, uh, and working in visual effects and animation for about 15 years now. Yeah, um, my name is Ken. I'm a senior 3D artist, and I've been at Buck around the same time, five years. Uh, hi, my name is Chloe, and I'm a 3D artist at Buck LA, and I've been at Buck for about four years now. Hi, I am Alfonso Peterson. I'm a senior 3D artist, and I've been working at Buck for five years. All right. Uh, well, you already heard a little bit of an introduction to who we are, but uh, the big question is, who is Buck? So again, um, we are a global creative company that crafts design, stories, technology, and technology that's experienced by billions every day. It's true. 
Um, <laughs> we work with advertising agencies, brands, film studios, and others. Here's some of our clients. Um, we provide design, branding, and strategy, experiential and interactive, live action, animation, and other creative <laughs> services. <laughs> We have offices in Los Angeles, New York, Sydney, Amsterdam, and now London. Oh, and Vancouver, actually. That's a new addition. <laughs> and uh, a big part of our business is animation, and specifically today we'll be talking about our work in 3D animation. Um, so uh, we're gonna play a quick sample of our work. Thank you. Um, so a bit about our teams. Uh, at Buck, we, our diverse clientele requires our workforce to be adaptable and versatile. While we highly value the unique expertise of our specialists, our teams are primarily composed of generalists. This emphasis on flexibility and adaptability enables us to create bespoke teams tailored to the specific needs of each project and client. Cross-disciplinary collaboration is central to our work culture. We value every team member's contribution, believing this is the diversity, this diversity is key to our distinctiveness and why people enjoy being a part of Buck. You can see from this very precise graph here. <laughs> um, many of us joined Buck with a specific role in mind, but found opportunities to explore adjacent disciplines that really bolster our main skill sets. We're big on continuous learning and encourage people to think more broadly about how they can potentially contribute to a project beyond traditional roles or expectations. So we'd like to share some of our personal experiences at Buck, um, and hopefully we can demonstrate our adaptability in action. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Kian to get us started. I'll trade with you here. <laughs> Good evening, guys. I'm Kian, I am from Vietnam. After finishing school in Ohio in 2018, I moved to LA to start my first full-time job at Buck. I hope you guys didn't have too much of those pizza because <laughs> I'll be talking a lot about food tonight. So I love procedural shading and especially procedural food shading. And if you're not familiar with what procedural shading is, it looks a little bit like this. It's mostly just texture building, but instead of using pre-built texture like a 3D scan or a photo, you would try to create the texture from scratch by blending and coloring noises and gradients. You can start from the most primitive shape and build it into something really complex. And by doing this, you're ensuring complete artistic control over every detail. CG food is just one of those things that's quite tricky to get right. We are wired to be so good at telling when something doesn't taste good or shouldn't be consumed at all. To me, procedural shading is all about fighting patterns in all things around us. Food makes it harder because it's so organic, but it makes it even more rewarding when you're able to find and replicate these patterns. My watermelon doesn't always look like this, though. In fact, when I was in school, I also made a watermelon. 
but it looks more like this. It's a little questionable whether it's edible or not is up for debate. But this ended up being on my demo reel that I applied to book with, amongst other things like modeling, lighting, rigging, <laughs> and even VFX. <laughs> I was the CG jack of all trades. <laughs> Much later on though, I was told by my supervisor who hired me that this watermelon was the thing that got me my job. When I was about to apply for jobs, one of the most recommended advice that I got from everyone around me was that I need to show breakdowns. What's better way to show breakdown than to build your things procedurally from ground up? So that's why I decided to texture this watermelon by just layering my default noises. That way I could have all the layers I want for my demo reel. I found out later on that it wasn't really about the execution of this that got me the job, because like honestly, it wasn't like that crazy. <laughs> But the process of breaking down textures into simple patterns and the desire to understand things on a fundamental level are the real reasons that they like my portfolio. As a wise man once said, if your supervisor says that they like something you did, you keep on doing it. <laughs> Which I did. <laughs> in the first few months at Buck, I decided that in order to impress my peer, I was gonna make a procedural burger. <laughs> <laughs> the rule I set for myself was that I could not touch any photos or pre-built texture. This whole thing would be built just with my default noises and ramps. And even the displacement was going to be procedural. This shader ended up being hundreds of nodes. It's completely impractical and insanely complicated. But the process was interesting. I did not know that burger could be built this way. <laughs> so over the years since, I have been thinking more about this process of building up complex things from their smallest part. And if you look at this idea more broadly, it's really just about looking at whatever it is that you like and understanding the building blocks that make up that thing. And when you do that, the whole thing becomes customizable. For example, you can switch out one of these wooden shelf legs for metal ones. You can paint one of them a different color, but the whole thing will still remain a functional shelf. Now let's talk about how this applies in a work environment. If you were like me, and you remember what it was like being a student, which a lot of you guys are still students, the part side of getting things approved on my thesis film was simple then. All I had to do was to convince my buddy Chad that things look good. Chad and I were the only two people working on this film. We were both directors, modelers, shaders, lighters, compers. We were basically a fully functional animation studio with two employees. Approvals were easy to come then. Now, years later, <laughs> I'm working with a whole lot of people. Going from school to the industry, this is one of the biggest changes that I noticed. I'm just now part of a machine that's hundreds of times bigger. I'm in a much more complicated relationship than when it was just two guys working on a film. Naturally, sometimes, this happens. Creative ideas clash, and the work is incredibly prone to changing all the time. So how do you stay proactive and even productive in this environment? I found my answer in the same thing that I was doing years ago. Keeping things modular, anticipating changes, and reacting quickly. I want to allow the most amount of flexibility in the way that I work so that changes, whether big or small, becomes less destructive. So 
This takes us to the first project that I wanted to talk about, Lake and Lake of Legends, and you know, Love, Death, and Robots are coming. I swear. So <laughs> just just bear with me <laughs> as I get through this food stuff. So this is a short and sweet 30-second spot for our client Bonnie Plants, and I hold this one really dear to my heart because I got to do a lot of food rendering on it. Let's take a quick look. When you start with a single Bonnie plant, you end up with the entire world in your kitchen. Imagine Pico de Gallo as it was meant to be. Create a pasta arrabbiata that fights back. Discover the classic Ethiopian tomato and lentil stew. Kick off a tailgate that's freshly grilled and freshly grown. Imagine the possibilities of more than 300 Bonnie varieties, all raised by hand, somewhere near you. Bonnie, what world will you grow? Thank you. So, going into this, we had a feeling that this was going to be a challenge. There wasn't really a spot about plants or 3D environments. In fact, the client made it clear to us that the food needed to be the hero. Because of this, making the food look good was only half of the equation. It was also crucial to set it up in a way that can be modified easily, because the art direction was evolving so constantly. There were a lot of people who worked on this: amazing concept artists, designers, our creative team, my 3D team. 3D animators who figure out the insane camera transitions, but for the purpose of this talk, I will be focusing mainly on the R&D of this pasta dish, and how we apply the concept of building blocks in every step of the way. So, step number zero: before we even do anything in 3D, it is one of the most important part of production. It keeps everyone on the same page. And it helps you train your aesthetics. There's also a lot of problem solving that happens just by you picking apart references. This is one of the aspects that I've noticed a lot of junior artists tend to underestimate. Sometimes, in trying to mimic a reference and then failing to do so, you kind of develop your own style. So that's like another interesting process. So. I find references by looking at our past projects, scouting the internet for images, or looking at other artists' work to see if this has ever been done before. For this, we looked at a lot of delicious pasta variations. Some with a lot of sauce, some with little sauce, and we're also paying attention to how the sauce interacts with the pasta. Once we have gotten a sense of what this needs to look like from our references and our amazing concept arts, a more precise breaking down exercise happens. At this stage, we will try to visually identify the building blocks of this pasta dish. As we all could see, the thing that takes up the most screen space is the pasta itself, and then secondly, we have this sauce coating. That is on every pasta, and the amount of coating ranges from little to a lot. We figure these first two elements were the most important because they are the most visible visually. Besides that, there are other extra elements like the more bespoke tomato chunks that appears here and there, providing visual pops. But lastly, garnishing. Like pepper and basil pieces. Here we also notice that the distributions of sauce plays a very important role in making this thing look believable. How it's heavily concentrated towards the center, and gradually feathers out towards the fringes. Now that we have a better understanding of the structure, we started to evaluate different options to. On how to actually make this thing. The one obvious options were to sculpt and texture the plate by hand, but by baking in too much information, 
we would limit our ability to respond to last minute changes, which happen a lot on projects like this. Option two is to do scoping on just the pasta and a liquid sim for the sauce. But simulation is one of those things that doesn't take a lot of time to make a VO one. But getting it to a V50 with daily revisions and feedbacks is where you really feel the cost of this approach. We just didn't have the time for this in our schedule. Lastly, we consider a more procedural workflow. With this approach, we would only model some simple passer proxy so that we're not constrained to any complex scoping passes. Then we would add more detail through procedural displacement and color maps. This way, we would have control over every detail and be able to make changes on the flight. So we proceeded with option three. Um, starting with our rough modeling pass, the goal is to keep it pretty simple and not try to make too much detail in the geometry. We modeled this one pasta that was going to be instanced everywhere and become the first building block of this dish. We then drop a bunch of them on a plane. The most satisfying part of the process, to be honest. <laughs> and dropping one on the ground there for extra realism. <laughs> At this step, we're also packing a bunch of utility vertex color maps. We might not know for sure what we might do with these just yet, but it seemed intuitive, like a mask for the tips of the pasta, in case we have to grade it differently in comp, or a random ID pass so that we can add some slight color variations to them, either in a shader or in comp. One of the key elements of this whole setup was this ID pass that breaks up the positions of these passes into tiers. Imagine if, you know, sometime in the future, I would have three passes texture. One with a lot of sauce, one with a medium amount of sauce, and one with no sauce at all. I can just assign them to these pasta based on these IDs that I'm setting up here and create an illusion of sauce distribution that I mentioned previously. Following the plan, we wanted to build most of the textures and displacements procedurally. Substance Designer was our tool of choice for this, at least for me personally. At this stage, layer by layer, the pasta is starting to take shape. And because we did this procedurally, the sauce coding which is driven by a noise that I can easily adjust in order to create variation, the pepper flex will also just a noise that I can control. And these are just a cycling through a couple of variation. And this is just literally me like hitting random seed on the noise generator node. Now, after days of prepping all the building blocks, we get to the most exciting part of this whole thing. Putting everything together and finally rendering it. We render this in Maya using V-Ray and do our final comping in Nuke. So now we're in Maya. The first step is just getting the plate of pasta from Houdini into the scene and adding some simple SSF material just to get you know, some overall feel for this dish. Nothing too crazy at this point. I'm just dealing with default material and you know, playing with some dials on the shader. This could also be the last step if you're into eating pasta with no sauce. <laughs> Next, I propagate variations of pasta textures that I kicked out from Substance Designers and assign them here based on the tier ID that I generated earlier. Displacement is then added along with reflectance and at this stage, things are starting to come alive. To boost this even further, 
I added an extra layer of the sauce to fill in the gaps. It's secondary and just helps fill in the blanks so that it doesn't need a lot of modeling detail. Um, all the detail you see here is just a generic noise that I put on the extra sauce layer just as displacement. Lastly, I added garnishing and final comping in Nuke. Because the whole thing was largely driven by procedural textures, I was able to modify my basic building blocks in order to generate really different looks. It took me only a few clicks in Substance Designers to generate new sets of variations. At this point, my pasta is ready to tackle any notes from anyone at any time. <laughs> and I think when you get to that stage of like seeing variations and how quickly it is to create different look is when you really see the power of this approach. It might take a little bit more time to set it up in the first place, but the reward is awesome. So I hope I was able to demonstrate this simple idea of looking at anything as a system of many small parts rather than just this one big thing. I do think that it's general enough of an idea that it can be applied to any discipline. Just before I pass the mic to Chloe, this is just an observation that from my years of working and learning different tools. As an artist become familiar with you know, one particular software or a range of software, there's a shift in their perspective from thinking about software-dependent approaches when starting a project to focusing on the data itself. What I mean by this is, for, for instance, when I look at the pasta references, my first thoughts are drawn to the gradients and noises that they represent rather than contemplating which software to start with. And I think this is truly one of the most powerful things about the generalist skill sets. Um, now, I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague, Chloe, who will be talking about a very similar theme of building blocks, but in the context of lighting and comping. Woo! Take it away. Um, hello everyone, my name is Chloe. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some of my experiences in approaching lighting and compositing. So first, a bit about myself. Before I decided to study digital arts, I was majoring in software engineering in college and didn't know anything about how to make animations. And when I just started learning about 3D, this is how I see lighting and compositing. <laughs> in fact, I held this thought all the way to the point uh, when I was doing my thesis with my partner. So basically, I saw lighting as this major process to get an almost final lit image and compositing as merely an overall color grading step. And this was our entire comp for a 10 second long shot. And back then we saw this is one of the most complicated compositing we've ever seen. <laughs> and FYI, um, this is a screen grab of a nuke file we did at Buck for a shot that is under one second. <laughs> so, clearly I have changed my mind as I knew more about the process and the industry. And I think especially after I started working, I found lighting and compositing really inspires and helps each other a lot. Uh, also in production, they go back and forth pretty often, so it makes a lot of sense to me to treat them together as a combo. And in some cases, compositing can help with some effects that is really hard to accomplish in lighting. So here's my new understanding about them. I start to treat compositing just as important as lighting, uh, if not more. And I feel this thought has helped me a lot when it comes to problem solving because uh, I'm not limited to just one tool anymore. And I think this also shows part of the benefit of being a generalist, uh, where knowing about different disciplines can help broaden up your perspectives. 
And after seeing them as like a combination, I also found it easier for me to just see them as two steps within uh, the same process. So one is to collect information and elements from 3D, and the other is to rebuild from the collected data for the final output. Uh, I'm going to explain it a little bit better using a more specific project. So I will take this one to demonstrate some of the breakdowns. And yes, this is the League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> so the project was made for the League of Leg Legends 2021 World Championship opening and part of the enemy music video, uh, which is also the theme song for the Netflix show Arcane. So naturally, everything needs to follow the style of that show. Uh, when this job came to us, we were really excited because uh, we love the unique look of the show and it's going to be a challenge to do this painterly and illustrative style. So the asks for this job at that time was to deliver a one and a half minute long opening shot with no cuts and 30 seconds stylized CG renders integrated with live action footage. And for all of this, we are only given about six weeks. So it's a really short amount of time and crazy tight schedule. We really need to come up with an efficient way using the tools we already have within the pipeline to get to this look. So before we start on anything, we first need to figure out what do we need. Uh, so the first step, also one of the most important steps we just mentioned, is to look at the reference images and to analyze them to see exactly what is contributing to the style. So we took many screenshots from the Arcane trailer and here are some of the hero references we were using. And after going through these images, this are some of the takeaways from the references that we found really important to the visuals. Several key points here. First, overall the shaders look kind of flat with a stylized painterly texture base that is not being affected a lot by the lighting. And second, it has a lot of the big color blocks without too many details, especially around the hair. And then it got this really graphic looking rim light across the surface and most of the areas have hard shadows without much soft fall off. And besides this, there are also some smaller details like the eye light having a very specific shape and there are some accent strokes around the eyes and the tip of the nose. So after the analysis, we now know these are the key elements we want to get. And we can also see that most of the points we just found are kind of in the opposite of what a more traditional CG render looks like, where um, it lands more in the realistic side and we get the environment reflection and soft fall off for free. So knowing this, it would be really difficult to achieve this style just within the lighting. And here's when treating lighting and compositing as a combo comes in handy. So we don't need to struggle ourselves within just one process too much. Uh, and I think this also shows the benefit of picking up an adjacent skill because it opens up the possibilities to solving uh, different issues. Um, based on all information we just learned, we can now think about how to get this information. And that's when we start the lighting process. <laughs> so like building puzzles, we first need to know which area we want to tackle. Uh, maybe it's the edges, maybe it's the characters. And only when we have a target, we can start to looking for the pieces that are matching. So same thing here. Um, so our target is to set up a good foundation for the general painterly look. And we will be collecting information for this purpose. And for this project, we were using Maya and V-Ray for lighting. And most of the shots had a very simple uh, light setup since we're going to rely on compositing a lot. Um, in the clip here, it only has one key light and the GI was turned off. The reason we were doing this uh, is because we are not looking for the final beauty render. Instead, what we are interested in is the black and white relationships in the lighting path here. So we can use it later in comp to rebuild hard shadows like we see in the reference. 
And another path we want to collect is the diffuse path, since it already, it already has this painterly texture base, and we want to make sure it gets enhanced rather than overtaken by the lighting. And after we collected those passes, along with some other uh, more commonly used passes, like uh, the bump normal and the world position, we can now go to compositing to start a rebuild. And in this case, we are also using Nuke. So first, we took the diffuse pass, did some color correction, so some to brighten up the eyes and the nose areas to make the strokes pop a little bit more, like the reference, and some to take away the additional details we don't need, like the hair strands. Later, we blend it back with the lighting pass to get the direction of the light and the shadow shapes. And after that, there are some uh, adjustments on the drop shadows, some additional lighting, and some color grading to match the live action plate. So at this point, we get to a pretty good base, but it's still missing that graphic ring lights from the reference. So, at, so right now, we need to go back to 3D to collect some more information that we can use to rebuild this. So as you can see, this is really a back and forth process. And back in Maya, in order to get the rim light, we created a customized path for this job that is called the light mask. So in the light mask layer, we override the entire scene with a tune shader and set the diffuse ramp to only RGB three colors. So when the light hits the surface, the bright part will get the color uh, of red, the dark part will get the color of blue, and everything in between will be green. By adjusting the ramp, we can control how much fall off we want in the render, which reflects the hardness of the light. So in this shot, what we are looking for is just a thin layer of light around the edges of the character. So we set up the ramp with red color taking up most of the portion and with very little green color. And we set up like two lights behind her so we can get ring light from both sides. And in some more complicated shots, we will need more than one set of light mask. So in the shot here with Jinx holding a monkey bomb, it shows more of the character and also is a much longer shot. So only one light mask is not going to be enough to cover the entire shot. So we ended up uh, setting up four sets of different light masks for her so we can mix and match them later in comp. And after we collect these passes, we can go back in comp again to build the ring light. Usually in the light masks, we will get some uh, unwanted extra bleeding, especially when the character is moving, so we need to clean them up first. And the general rule of thumb for cleaning up uh, is to imagine uh, if you are painting this frame, what choice would you make as a painter? Basically, areas that are too soft need to go. Uh, lights that bleed too much into the center need to be constrained more to the edges. And shapes that are too distracting also need to be removed. And after the cleanup, we can use it as a mask on top of the base we just created to add the rim light. And then we add back the background plate, some light wrap up, and also some more color grading to match the sequence. And usually for longer projects, we would want to standardize this process across different shots to make it more streamlined. And now when we take a step back and look at the whole process, what we were really doing is taking these six passes and using them to recreate the images. And I think this echoes to that modularity idea where we break bigger issues into smaller chunks so we can have more control over the process and also the file can be easily adapted across different shots. Um, in this particular case, 70% of the final renders rely heavily on compositing and the usage of these passes, so it makes a more clear point. But the same mindset can be used in almost every project, like for the passes on the top here, uh, we actually use them for most of jobs we've worked on. And here is the final render for that shot. And also the same process is shared among most of shots in this project. There are some modifications for each shot specifically, uh, but the general idea is very identical. And 
I think that pretty, pretty much wraps up my part. Uh, and I will pass it to Afonso. Thank you very much, Chloe. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, so my name is Alfonso Peterson. I'm a senior 3D artist from Guadalajara, Mexico. And I do modeling, look dev, lighting, and compositing. When I first started my career, I only wanted to do modeling, and mainly because I realized that I could model and watch Netflix at the same time, which was fantastic. And then I landed my first job at an animation studio in Mexico, where there was no crossover between departments. And it was until the studio got booked to do this very ambitious short film that they asked me if I was willing to learn a hair system called Yeti. And I remember that it was a very complicated process at first and very frustrating, mainly because this hair system was illegal in the US and all the available tutorials were in Russian. And <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I didn't take Russian in college. So it took us a few weeks to figure it out, but in the end my colleagues and I, and I were able to understand it and ultimately we were able to deliver and we did a really good job. When I applied to Buck, this is the before, by the way, don't think it's the after. Uh, <laughs> when I applied to Buck, I remember that one of the things that they liked about my profile was that not only I could model, but I could also make my models hairy. And I could also do a little bit of textures, and I said that I was willing to learn other disciplines if they needed that from me. I've been at Buck for over five years now, and today I want to present one of my favorite Buck projects of all time. This is a project in which all the four of us had the opportunity to contribute in one way or another, and along with a team of very talented people. And the name of this film is uh, Broly Days, which is the holiday commercial for the online game Brawl Stars, which has over 50 million active users. So let's take a moment to watch it. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the reasons why this project is so special to me is because I was tasked with leading the character modeling team. And the first step for us was to understand the concept. This wasn't going to be the classic Disney type film, mainly because the characters are not made of flesh and bones like they usually are, but instead they are animatronics. And as animatronics, there are certain implications that come with that. First, there had to be a thought process of how they were going to be built. So it was decided they were going to have this mechanic skeleton underneath with ball and socket joints. Some of uh, these inner wirings would be visible. Sometimes they would be hidden underneath uh, like clothing. But regardless or not they were hidden, you would still have to be able to tell that there was a hard skeleton underneath. And this was very like important to tell and communicate with all the other departments because not only it's going to be modeled differently, but it's also going to be rigged differently, and it's also going to be animated differently. And the sooner you get everybody on the same page, the less iterations you'll have further down the line. Then there were uh, other characters like this one whose limbs were so short that there's really, really not enough room to even put like an elbow joint. So what we did is we modeled, we, we modeled it in T-pose, we had it rigged, and we had animators pose it as like however they want it. But we didn't want the bending to happen when the audience could see it, because that would break the illusion. 
So uh, the animators would pose the arm before the shot has started, and once it has begun, they would mostly rotate it from the shoulder joints. So all of this to help us keep the illusion that this is made of plastic, when in reality it's made of quads, which, as we all know, is the most <laughs> bendable thing known by humankind. <laughs> and then uh, we also took into co consideration the detail of the hands to help sell the materiality and scale of the characters, because when puppets or toys are this tiny, there's usually not like enough room to put like uh, joints in the knuckles because they would be so tiny. And they're usually just like 3D printed as a single piece. So that's what we were trying to imitate. So we modeled the hand as one single piece and we thought it would be like a nice touch to merge the middle fingers as if a 3D printer couldn't like separate them because they were so close together. Then we had to figure out how are we going to be able to convey emotions when the characters only get one facial expression that is already baked in the geo? We have two things for that. The first one was the eyebrows, which are a separate uh, geo, so we could rotate them or move them up and down. But we also have these like really cool LED eyes inspired in the not creepy at all Furbies. <laughs> and we had to figure out along with design which was going to be the ideal resolution for that, because when we tried like bigger pixels, we just weren't getting the resolution that we needed to do all the shapes that we wanted. So we had to do uh, smaller pixels and we were able to do all the symbols that you see on screen. Now. <laughs> uh, now let's talk a little bit about clothing. Um, simulation of clothes is almost never in the budget for these kind of projects because, as Kian said, it just takes so many resources, and this is already an expensive project as it is. So what we do instead is we bake the wrinkles in the geo and hope that nobody notices. Uh, we usually model the clothing in Maya, make the UVs, take it to ZBrush, add a few subdivisions, and then do the sculpt there. Then we export the displacement map. But if we want to have a true match between what we see in ZBrush and what we see in the render, we have to bring the new LOD0, or the new low poly, back into Maya because it probably underwent certain deformations during the sculpt. When we bring it to Maya, now there's another problem, which is this new geo is asymmetrical, and that can mean a lot of problems for rigging. So what we like doing is we keep a version of the clothing, the symmetrical one, hidden in the outliner so that the riggers can find it, skin it, skin it mirror the weights, and then, since we kept the same vertex count on both geos, they're able to transfer the weights from the symmetrical geo to the asymmetrical one, and that's the one that gets rendered. Now, I'm gonna talk about a shot that I was tasked for lighting and compositing. When I first pick up this shot, we realized that the groom that has been made for this character and that we had used for many other shots was not holding up in the close-up. And that is something completely normal. It happens a lot in 3D. Like sometimes, you know, something looks, from, looks go good from a certain distance, and then you see in a close-up and you're like, ugh, I don't deserve to have a job. Uh, but this is one of those cases where it just needs a little bit more of, uh, you know, a little bit more work. So this is when being a generalist comes really handy because I found a problem that I can solve myself without having to rely on another artist's availability. So I started doing an alternative version of this groom with different hair density, different hair texture, uh, thickness, and a different set of clumps. And uh, since there's no one else involved in this one process, you can be more experimental with your solutions, and you can also allow yourself to like, make more mistakes without like, the fear of being judged by Chloe, for example. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, it, it was very easy to just do a few tweaks in the, uh, in the grooming file and then immediately test it in the lighting file and see how it was reacting to the lights, how it was reacting to animation, and if it was going in the right direction, just keep going, and if not, just like version back. Uh, whereas if it had been like two people involved, that would be like five Zoom meetings or something like that, so <laughs> let's avoid yeah. that. Uh, and just to finish my section, if I can give you a piece of advice, that would be learn Russian. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> I don't think that everybody needs to know how to do everything because nobody really can, but I do think that the more you learn about the neighboring disciplines surrounding your own, 
uh, you can become a better asset for certain kind of studios. You can also find more creative solutions for certain problems. And I do think that ultimately you become a better artist. So that is it for me. And now I'll pass the floor to Mark. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Alfonso. <laughs> um, so, uh, a bit about me. Um, I started in post production, ingesting tapes mostly, and I um, gradually worked my way up to becoming a colorist. I spent several years grading commercials, indie features, and a ton of music videos, a lot of really bad ones actually. <laughs> um, over time, I began integrating visual effects and 3D animation into my skill set. Um, I eventually landed at Buck, where I started as a visual effects supervisor um, and senior compositor. Uh, and then it gradually, I transitioned into a role um, in a leadership role in the 3D team. So I've had quite a meandering path to get where I am today. For many years, I thought that my lack of specialization was um, like a weakness. Uh, however, I've discovered that the diversity of my work experience is actually one of the best things I can bring to my role as a supervisor. Um, even though I'm not an expert in everything, I have a pretty good idea of how like most parts of the process work. So I'd like to talk about a couple projects uh, where I feel like my you know, diversity of experience really helped. So the first one is um, we did a series of spots for uh, Truly, which is a fun hard seltzer. <laughs> um, one great thing about working at Buck is that we often get to feel like a sense of ownership over a project when we're able to contribute from start to finish. Um, I collaborated with a talented team of people on these spots. Um, in fact, Chloe and Ken both worked on this. Sorry, Alfonso, next time. Um, but I was happy to be able to contribute at every step of the process um, in addition to supervising. So I'll show a little bit of the work that I did on these spots. Um, first, I'll play, I'll play the first one we did. Um, yeah, so, uh, like I talked a bit about the adaptability that we have at Buck. Um, this sort of motion design project, we had to kind of put together a different type of team. So, um, the process for this sort of thing starts in design. Uh, here's some frames I did kind of like early in the visual exploration phase. They're a little rough, but we were trying to get a sense of the visual language of the project. and. Um, to hit a note from the client about blending like fruit with effervescence in interesting ways, fruit and um, and uh, you know trying to use these sort of surreal imagery. Um, then uh, we kind of moved into a motion exploration phase, where we just tried out ideas. Um, these were a few of the things that I kind of threw in the in the ring. Um, if you like particles, like I do, Houdini is like the most fun place to do this stuff. Um, so here's a view of the animatic that our editor put together. Um, he collected some of the motion tests we were working on and um, some storyboards and started putting it together. We were just trying to feel out the, the timing and the edit. Um, you know, some of it's further along than other parts. After we decided on what shots we needed, we created more refined versions of the animation. Um, the Raspberry Formation is a procedural animation I made in Houdini with a lot of Vex, and it's, um, which is the scripting language. And it's based on a motion idea that, our, that another person did, our animator Adam, who had done this uh, cool animation in Cinema 4D. The Peaches uh, were <laughs> an idea I suggested early on. Um, and here they're, they're simulated in Houdini with Vellum. And here they are rendered in Houdini with V-Ray, um, complete with some peach fuzz. <laughs> um, 
And here's that Raspberry again. So having a team of generalists really helped with this project as we had like just, we had about six weeks to complete two of these 30 second spots. So it was a really, really a whirlwind. Um, cool, so I'm gonna talk about another project. So on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we had a decent amount of time for this one, but limited resources at different points along the way. Uh, we were excited when Netflix and Blur approached us to contribute to their anthology, Love, Death, and Robots. We're really big fans, of course. Um, we knew we didn't have the availability to take on the entire thing ourselves, so we partnered with Rodeo FX, who handled a lot of the shots. Um, but one of the shots we knew we were going to be taking on was this big opening shot. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's like a little R-rated, but I'll show you <laughs> an excerpt, and I, I uh, suggest you take a look on Netflix if you have the chance. So here's like a short... Uh <laughs> um, so this shot posed a few challenges. One, it was going to be on screen for a while, like a, I think it, I can't remember exactly, but it's at least a couple minutes. Um, it would have lots of changing dynamic lighting setups, and I quickly realized we couldn't use stock photography or matte painting like we did for most of the other shots in the short. And if you haven't seen it, the whole thing is that it's um, a miniature zombie apocalypse and it's like all tilt shift. Um, so I decided I'd have to build the whole thing out in 3D, uh, but before that, uh, before I talk about that, I'm gonna just share some of the incredible work that the team did um, leading up to my contribution. So, um, the storyboard artist and the editor kind of put together a board matic of the sequence, and this was crucial for figuring out the story and the timing. <laughs> uh, then our concept artist put together this frame in 3D. Um, it's actually Unreal, which is interesting. Normally we don't do that. Uh, he figured out the mood and the layout of the, all the sort of major set pieces. Uh, and this is also something we don't normally do for a 3D animation project, uh, but sometimes we like to do pencil tests. Um, and we relied on um, a cell animator here, you know, from within Buck to figure out uh, the blocking and the comedy of the sequence. And then we moved into actual 3D animation. So this, this scene was mostly done by our incredible animation supervisor, Pete DeSalvo. I'll, I'll zoom in so you can see the detail on this because it's pretty funny. Um, and again, I apologize for not showing the whole thing, but... <laughs> no, there was no motion capture, in case you're wondering. <laughs> All right. So, um, here's where I come in. So I knew I wanted to do this shot fully in 3D and also because I'm a Houdini fanatic. I decided to build out the environment in Houdini. Maya is definitely like the workhorse of Buck 3D animation, uh, but I really prefer to not use it for anything too complex, um, or really at all. <laughs> As my coworkers Boo. know. Um, but it is great. Um, so I scattered, uh, I realized I, had, I scattered like 500,000 tufts of grass for this one. We don't do a ton of really complex natural environments at Buck. And I'm certainly not a special at the, specialist at this, um, but I think the thing I came up with is a pretty serviceable setup for the shot. So, uh, first I had tested having each tuft of grass be an instance, like simulated Alembic cache with random offsets, but it really didn't look as good as <laughs> I had hoped it would, and it also um, was really cumbersome to work with, even in Houdini. So I came up with a solution of just running a noise through instances to drive their rotation. And it's sort of convincing. Um, just simple rotation did the trick and it's, um, well, it's not extremely realistic. It holds up okay at this scale. And then the trees uh, were simulations done by our artist Carlos, who's a generalist, but he leans more towards the effect side of things um, for some subtle tree action there. Um, our animator did an amazing job uh, with the thing, especially with some of the, um, the pieces of this church destruction moment, which I think when, <laughs> sometimes when, um, when a keyframe animator works on something like this, it can actually bring comedy to it that wouldn't really be there 
in uh, a simulation, but I, something about this is funny to me. Um, so the purple parts are all keyframe animated, and I added these simulated elements to help enhance it. Um, and so that's uh, like some rigid body, some particles, and a bit of uh, pyro for dust. Um, and Carlos uh, did this great lightning moment, <laughs> satanic fire moment. <laughs> um, so here's like, here's the whole scene uh, in a clay pass, a clay render. And um, this doesn't have any textures, but you can see the, the uh, amount of crap that I threw in this. And here is the, uh, here's like my shader setup. This is all V-Ray. Um, it looks kind of in intimidating, but I actually find Houdini to be a lot easier to work in for shading than Maya. Uh, if anyone's familiar with Hypershade, they might understand why I say that. Um, and then uh, I started some look dev and shading. Um, I didn't really spend a ton of time on these. Um, it's just a procedural shader where I kind of cranked the specular because I knew it was gonna be seen from that scale. <laughs> um, cool, so uh, here is the base lighting. Uh, we went for a classic genre backlit moonlight vibe. Uh, here's the base comp, all, all in Nuke, of course. The atmosphere I did all in comp, um, except for there's some volumetric lights on the car headlights at the beginning. Um, here's the tilt shift effect. So for this short, um, it's, it, the idea was that it would be tilt shift. Um, there's a difference between tilt shift and depth of field. Tilt shift is kind of more of a screen space effect where it's not about depth and it's more about like a gradient across the frame. Um, and the shots use a mixture of the two depending on what worked the best. And this one ended up working better with the like, depth of field effects uh, so we could have that steeple stand out over the background. And here's a color grade that I did um, in comp to give it more of like a horror vibe and get it a little closer. Um, we darkened it even further actually on the, on the request of, uh, you know, the leadership um, in the final grade, which I didn't resolve, but this is where I took it in comp. So, okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so anyway, just to wrap up, um, the variety of ways I was able to contribute to that project were really fun. We've been talking a lot about general skill sets, and uh, we all also have like an area we gravitate more towards. Not every studio is looking for the same mix of skills, and there's no right or wrong approach. There are advantages to being either a generalist or a specialist. But I think we recommend keeping an open mind, and when you can, exploring adjacent skills. So thanks for letting us show, show you a little bit about our process at Buck. All right, y'all, if you've been to a uh, Noman event before, you know that we're about to run some Q&A. So here's how we do this. Uh, you can raise your hand. I'll be working from the back to the front. If you keep your hand up and you see me point at you, then that means I got you in my mental queue <laughs> that I got going on here. So uh, anybody in the back here have any questions? If not, if you have a question, throw your hand up. Oh, perfect. I'm going to start over here. I got you. Yes, okay, great. Thank you so much for the presentation, it was great. Uh, just one question is, what was the timeline on the Brawler Days project? Hi, um, so I don't have a specific uh, number because I wasn't involved with leadership and I don't know like how much happened between you know when I started and when it got delivered. I think, if I remember correctly, it was probably under less than two months and a half, and that's like also taking into account design. Like these are usually like really fast projects, and when they have to come for, you know, for Christmas, they usually like, we do them like around like September or something like that. Hi, a uh, similar question about just the time frame of how long certain projects take. I was just curious, like the shortest time frame you get to like the longest, like what, 
that could ra range at. One time somebody, I think it was the Truly client, asked us for like a render of a turntable of one of the cans, and I made it in like, in Blender EV in like five <laughs> minutes or something. That was the fastest. <laughs> um, longest term, we have design projects that last years, um, but for, it, it depends, but for like an animation project, uh, I don't know, like six, It's like, yeah. so like sometime, a small project that lasts for two months turned into a two years campaign because the client keeps exactly. coming back to us and asking for more. And that actually brings back a lot of horrifying memories <laughs> <laughs> of client, after we deliver something that looks sweet to the client, they come back and ask for the littlest changes, but it would mean re-rendering the whole thing. And those usually we have like days to respond to. Yeah. And um, those just like kind of like pop out from nowhere. And usually we don't have resource just set aside for that contingency. And um, whenever that happened, we just like have to like scramble up the team to try to make that happen. But I think we service our clients like really well at Buck. And everyone seems to be very happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on the whole, like for commercial spots and things like that, the projects are like roughly like six weeks to two months or something like that. Is yeah. That mm -hmm. I don't know. I usually stay on project for like a month or two. Hello. Um, so my question is kind of a two-parter. So for the League of Legends spot, um, it seemed like you guys did like a lot of kind of more manual stuff in uh, post to get that look, um, like you know with uh, like uh, rotoing out like the light masks and stuff like that. Um, how much of that sort of like manual artistic stuff do you guys like do? Um, <laughs> And then uh, is that like the normal workflow or was there some sort of like way you automated that? Well, um, it really, it depends on the project. So a project that is this more sort of um, non-photorealistic style, uh, we lean more towards comp-based solutions for the reasons Chloe talked about um, because it gives us, you know, a ton of control and um, the ability to respond quickly to um, requests. Um, the, I mean, we we rely extensively on on comp at Buck, even on photorealistic stuff. So, um, but we're kind of like, like I was we were saying before, we're pretty adaptable. So we kind of like build a process uh, uniquely for almost every um, client or project that we join. I think I can expand on that. Yeah, go ahead. A bit more. Um, it really depends on, you know, the time that we have for each project, but I think the mentality is like we always try to push for something that is a little bit more procedural. That way, you know, if, if for example, we have other jobs that have sort of that painterly, of, you know, style besides, you know, League of Legends, and we have developed tools where, you know, that sort of like rotary masking was done automatically just based on like utility passes and um, you know, 3D data that we get from Maya into Nuke. So um, if we have like very little time you know, from design to like showing a VO1 of something, then some manual you know, creation needed to happen just to make that happen. But um, I think ideally we would try to develop tool within Nuke to just do that automatically for us. Like, I mean, if we do that, then we can scale it way up to, if you're making like a two or three minutes short, it would be like ter a terrible idea to just like roto every single part. And animation is like evolving all the time too. So which ev with, we don't want with every animation update, we have to redo all of our roto. And we learned that from really painful lessons. So. <laughs> yeah, and for the League of, Le of Legends job, we only have six weeks, so there are a lot of role learning, but also we use a lot of like utility paths to like to clean up those edges, like those bump normals or world position. So it's not all manual. And so, and for longer projects, like Kian just said, we would want to make it like a tool of, out of it and just kind of like standardize the uh, process a little bit more. 
Yeah. Hello? Sorry. Uh, I had a question about uh, how do, what problems do you usually experience doing vocalization or how do you sync audio with the uh, animations? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry for my accent. Uh, <laughs> So my question was, how do you sync audios and how you work with vocalization for your animations? Or what is the, how is the communication happening between right. animators and audio uh, editors? Well, I guess to be honest, we don't do a ton of stuff that's like sync to voice. Yeah, we, we don't do a lot of like speaking animation. Yeah. And usually if you think about commercial, like it's not a lot of like animated commercial. It's not a lot of speaking. Usually it's just like types that appear or like title cards. And for those, it would just be um, handled by our AA team. And we would just get translations for <laughs> different languages for the type. Um, but I, I don't recall like running into that particular issue with audio and animation for at least like any of the work that I've been on um, yeah. personally. I don't remember doing like a different a uh, different animation for a different language or something, but. Yeah, for like Love Dead and Robot, like everything was sped up. <laughs> yeah. So that no, the, the audio was just like people like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, like, <laughs> if you can I localize mean, we'll, that. <laughs> yeah, we do, like a spot will have different voiceover languages. I mean, there are some circumstances where we know we'll have to do like 50 different languages or something like that. Most of the time that's typography um, and for cir circumstances like that, we will build systems with our some of our um, more technical people to yeah. automate that process. Um, and sometimes that has happened in, in comp a couple times as well. If that was ever the case, I would imagine it would be a conversation that happens during the bidding process of the project. Yeah. Because that definitely calculates into the complexity of the, the project. If client is asking for you know five variations of the animation with different lang languages, so. We rarely deal with that, you know, last minute. It's usually something that discuss pre-production. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, so my question uh, is in regards to League of Legends. Sorry to bring it back to that again, but um, um, I was wondering with that, when you with the six-week turnaround time, how much like communication, asset sharing, are there between you and the other studios who are involved with, with that project? And you know, how do you break that time timeline down in your workflow? Yeah, so um, I wasn't, I actually wasn't super involved with that project, but I do believe that we worked with the studio that did the show, right? Mm -hmm. To receive the... It was a really it small three team yeah. on that job. I think it was just Chloe who worked yeah. on that job on this panel. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was a it was a, like a really small team, like four or five of like like the from the three D part are involving for this project. I remember we were receiving some assets from the from like the client site, and then the obviously the live action plate. And then the rest of the, those are just like, we figuring out the style and how to do the process because we don't really have the tools uh, from the show. So we kind of need to create this style from scratch and also still need to match, yeah. Yeah, I can like, yeah, go ahead. there were definitely like instances, I, I've worked on another project where I had like one month to do an opening for a feature film. And um, at that time, we would get like live plates, like live, live action plates from the client, and then Buck would do some 3D you know, design on top of it. Um, and that's part which is like fully com computer animated by us. Um, and I remember the process being like, the first week we would get a really rough pass of the live plate. And the team on their end is like still working on like everything. Like it looks super rough, like terrible color grading and that's kind of like the, the name of the game. You kind of work together constantly. I would get new plates like every two days. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there's like really major changes. And then yeah. you kind of have to adapt. Um, again, that's why like we so yeah. focus on setting everything mm -hmm. so that we can make changes really quickly. 
Yeah, um, same with League of Legends. So for the plate, uh, we actually receive like a totally different color grading on it. Like after we already set up like a base for the pipe uh, for the pipeline, and then when we receive like new color grading, we also need to match it like from the scratch again. Yeah. I think with these really short turnaround things, we don't have time to sort of synchronize our pipeline with another studio. So sometimes the best solution is just to figure out how to do it ourselves. And I think that's what we did here. Yeah. But it's also like the fun part of it. It is the fun it's part, like, yeah. <laughs> you guys are still in school. Like, I remember when I was in school, that's sort of like hacking everything together. Just to like, it's like everything it barely works <laughs> because everything is done like the day before. Um, <laughs> And we always have to like figure out these like clever solution to everything. I think we like carry some of that energy into our like everyday work, which I think is like really fun. I will I will say though that we have like an excellent pipeline for our animation. So there are I was gonna say that. Yeah, yeah. There are foundational <laughs> parts to our our pipeline that are like well yeah. established and very uh, and amazing. So we have that sort of foundation we can lean on, and then we um, sort of adapt around the needs of the client. Thanks for making us seem more Yeah, I don't want to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're totally not just our college kids. <laughs> our rigging department will be mad if we don't. So we have like amazing yeah, like, we rigging have tools. Like, yeah, we have like TDs and your yeah. tool development team. Yeah. Yeah. OK, um, I have a question regarding tools. So in particular, in context of procedural modeling framework. Um, so do you ever th thought about that you might want something more than currently what Houdini delivers. So including the scripting and uh, the set of nodes that Houdini has. Um, have you ever thought that you might want to have a node that doesn't exist in Houdini, for example, or something like that? Uh, yeah. Well, um, I, I mean, I love Houdini. I use it for any sort of procedural modeling task that I have to do. Um, I think it's honestly, it's like kind of singular in that it feels like there's no like limitation <laughs> to anything you can do in it. Um, generally, when I when something like that happens where there's not a node that exists, I use uh, the scripting language Vex uh, to do the thing that I need. And you know, sometimes we'll build little um, digital assets, like little gizmos, like based around combinations of nuke nodes and vex. Um, and uh, same goes for nuke. Like we will do like blink scripts, like custom things for nuke. Um, we have lots of like custom pipeline scripts and things that help us with repetitive tasks. But yeah, generally like the tools that are available in Houdini, including the scripting language, allow me to do basically anything that I can think of. So. I don't often hit the limitation, but I don't know if you... Yeah, like, I, I'm not a TD, but we have a pipeline team. Um, and it's like one of the greatest day of the year when you get like a major pipeline update yeah. from that team. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a present that is nicely you know, wrapped. Um, but they, they usually work kind of behind the scene. And uh, for Houdini, I know we develop uh, like a whole like asset management um, yeah. toolkit. Um, so that, you know, animator, shader artist, and, you know, modeler and lighter can all kind of work concurrently. And um, the whole part is just, um, just like versioning, you know, management. Um, so that's like one of the things, like one of the examples of a tool with the um, kind of in a custom way for the software. And we have a separate, you know, set of tools for Maya. Um, so it's like this kind of thing you see when you work at a studio because there's a lot of hands, you know, touching the same project. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Hello. So, uh, I mean, for the Brawlhalla project, mm -hmm. you mentioned that there just simply wasn't any resources available for class simulation. Um, and so that was kind of like passed on to like a rigging department issue to solve. And then for Love, Death, and Robots, you mentioned that you did have a longer timeline, but your uh, resources were kind of limited in different ways. Mm -hmm. So I was curious of how much budget and timeline affects the, the project and how 
the resources are dispersed between departments? Yeah, um, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, the budget and timeline are like the whole, that's like, you know, a huge part of what affects like what we can put into a team. Um, so when we first get approached with the project, we get approached with like a brief, uh, which is like a creative brief that will list out like the um, idea for the project and the expectations. And so we'll break it down uh, based on what we think the client's asking for and it'll be an open conversation. And then we will um, take a look at the timeline they're asking for. Um, and then we take a look at who's available to work on a project. Um, and we're a very busy studio. We have lots of projects running at the same time. So we're constantly playing a game of, you know, shifting people around and trying to put together the puzzle of finding enough resources for a project. So sometimes who's available dictates the way that we decide to um, achieve something. Um, I think in the case of Brawler Days, it's more that adding a level of cloth simulation onto character animation really kind of slows down the process. It, it makes every iteration uh, more expensive um, to do. It's not that we don't, we didn't necessarily have somebody available to, you know, for one day or something to go in and simulate one of the, the uh, costumes. It's just the amount of accumulated extra time and money that that adds w would take away from uh, other resources that we wanted to put towards things that would be more visible. And like Alfonso was saying, you don't really notice, you, don't, you can't really tell that, that it doesn't feel like something's missing. Um, and so that was just a determination we made early on in the process. If I may add to this, uh, I guess production also sees like what are the no negotiables. So if we do have, you know, a few people that do simulation that are available, we, ha we know we have a moment where there's like explosions here or explosions there or uh, this character get that gets electrocuted. So those are definitely we can do in another way that is not simulation. Whereas the clothing is something that is like, you know what, we could do this in modeling. It, it won't look as amazing as it could, but it's the only way to do it. Why? Because, you know, the explosion and the uh, electrocution of the Santa Claus, it's like, it's in very like three specific shots and it's not happening throughout the entire uh, scene, right? Or through the entire film, whereas characters are like always in frame. So that's when we have to like, decide which are the no negotiables and what's really important and yeah like what's basically gonna show yeah, yeah that's a really good point i think like we like all want like the ferrari versions of the project yeah <laughs> every single one of us because that stuff is cool but there's like a reality of you know production and when you're like staffing for any of these projects it's not such a like mark says not such a individualistic process where you just look at one project, it's like, what is the rest of all the stuff that is going on in you know, the studio? Like, are we, by doing this like simulated cloth, is any other sort of project is gonna suffer? Um, so it's, it's like a game um, that is quite complicated. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, Thanks, so a great presentation. And I, so it sounds like the four of you have been at Buck for uh, at least five years. How would you say the last few years have been in terms of the collaborative process? I know you guys probably had to be at home and I don't know if you guys are hybrid now, but I know with newer artists coming in or younger folks onboarding people without being present in the yeah. studio is probably a little different than it was a few years ago. And maybe, you know, I don't know how, you know, I'm sure with your pipe, pipeline's probably very developed in that way, but for things like art directing or problem solving with someone next to you? How does that work these days? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we, um, we went into working remote immediately as soon as it was like March of 2020. Um, our IT department like thankfully put it together very quickly. And so we've been like actually mostly remote since then, but with hybrid for a couple of years now. Uh, we just moved into a new office and it's really nice so we're trying to <laughs> get people to come in and we've noticed um, that there was something missing from being in person with people that we kind of forgot about which is like that um, sort of ease of just like you know looking over at the person sitting next to you and seeing what they're doing and having a conversation about it 
it makes like mentoring way easier because you can sit down with somebody and show them something um, that maybe gets lost over a, a Zoom call. Um, so yeah, I think um, the process has definitely changed, um, but we're trying to integrate things that we feel like we're missing out on now. Maybe yeah. Ken, you have? Yeah, I, I've yeah. recently like, thought about this a lot yeah. um, <laughs> because we just got back to the office. Um, so we definitely like learning along the way. When COVID just happened, like, like a lot of other people, we just start staying at home. And I think it's during the first year, I loved it. <laughs> I was like, I'm an, I'm an introvert. Like, I, I don't like being around other people. Um, so staying at home was great. But then um, as that you know, uh, whole situation drags back out longer, there was like things that we started to miss from you know, our time being together. And I think the reason why the first year of COVID worked out really well was because it was built on the capital um, that we you know, all built together by working in person for True, yeah. you know, the three years before COVID happened for some of us. Um, and then as that capital you know, started to run out, you start to notice slight changes. And I see it the most in incoming you know, junior artists. Um, there's, you know, when, you, when you've just got out of school and you haven't worked anywhere, that communication is so important. And for me, I remember just being in the office during you know, my first six months, wasn't really doing much, but I remember like eavesdropping into like every single conversation. I was sitting next to my supervisor. So I was like listening to, into every single one of his call. And the thing that you picked up from by just doing that is like insane. It's like priceless. And I think that's kind of like the experience that a lot of the newer artists are missing out on. And I do see, like, you know, there's all two sides to the, the whole argument. And um, I do see the benefits of letting people, you know, start their family away somewhere. It's, it's more affordable. But then also the reality of, like, developing a team that definitely has gotten, like, harder when everyone is not together. Um, it might not be, you know, apparent for junior artists, but the more you know, senior you get, the more of that you see. Um, yeah, but we, we're learning like every other company. Um, yeah. yeah, try to figure that out. Um, so I have kind of a two-part question. So the first one is, it uh, sounds like everyone here do a bit of everything. Like, oh no, everyone has their specialty, but it sounds like the studio is very collaborative and it's like, if you know a bit of this, you can do this as well. So I was just wondering when a project come out, how do you assign each other to the position? Do you usually got assigned to like, if you're coming as an effects artist, do you usually get assigned to the effects or you will have to adapt based on the work that you receive and change your position or maybe the, like, you might do a bit of comp and lighting and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, like we said, we it really depends on, it kind of comes back to the question about resourcing and it's like who's, who's available to work on this, who would be the best person for this task or this, um, you know, slot, um, to fill the slot. Um, we, yes, w like a lot of us are generalists and some of us uh, are, you know, more lean towards one particular skill um, and so we do have some true specialists as well. Um, I really, it really comes down to like knowing your team and knowing um, everyone's like strengths and weaknesses. Um, and it's just kind of a creative process at the beginning to kind of put together uh, the best team for the job. Um, and we also, you know, tend to like to push people out of their comfort zone. So sometimes we'll make a decision just like, hey, this person's just been doing you know, they've just been doing um, lighting the whole time, but when they interviewed with us, they said they were interested in animation. Maybe this is like a good opportunity because it's not too high pressure for them to try out some of those skills. So we try to give people opportunities to um, explore other areas. Um, but some people express that they want to fo stay focused on one thing, and we um, respect that as well. 
Um, I don't know if anyone else has. Uh, sure. Add. Yeah, so I am a 3D artist, uh, but I'm not at the level of being a supervisor. So, for example, I, it's, it's not like I choose what's going to be my role in each project. Uh, it's, so it's usually like higher ups who make that decision. But what they do is like a puzzle of the persons that are available and what is also their specialty. So for example, even if I'm in senior level, I know that maybe my camping skills might be here whereas my modeling skills might be here. So I might be assigned as a leader in a modeling team, but maybe not the leader in a compositing team. And but it doesn't mean that I'm not going to do compositing for that team. Like maybe I'll just like shift from modeling to compositing, but I'll be under like under someone else's uh, lead. Uh, so that's really cool because you can be like, you know, under the lead of someone in some part of the process, and then like it switches, and that's you know very cool because both people can learn from each other. And I've actually like, you know, remember very specific situations where I've like asked for help from these three people because you know they're just so smart and so good at what they do. And uh, it's just great to be able to collaborate in that way. And I know that if I was just like at home by myself, I would, I don't like, there would, there would be nowhere to get that knowledge from. Uh, but it's very easy to have, you know, people next to you and that you can just like ask them right away your questions. Yeah, I think like one of the things that I really liked um, when I started a book was it seems like there's a kind of a personal connection that I had with my direct supervisor. And I always felt like, you know, they were looking out for me and looking out for my interests. Because I don't feel like I was ever like put on a project against my will. <laughs> um, there seems to be a very you know, developed like thought process behind personal development. And we do actually care like what people want to do mm -hmm. and where people are seeing themselves in the future. So if you know, if someone who really like leading others, then we would start developing a path for them. Um, maybe start having them, you know, being on project that is really small so that they would have a lot of communication with the creative team, you know, interacting with um, creative directors or client to start developing that communication skill. So it's like smart step to you know, help each artist, artist get to where they want to be uh, eventually. Um, but that's something I, I'm really grateful for um, working at Bug. Thank you so much, that was awesome. Um, and just last part of the question is just, sounds like you guys went through about four and five projects and then you guys use all different software for all of them <laughs> so like one's using like a shader in maya and moving to nuke another one like lighted the whole thing in houdini and moving to nuke so i was wondering how much freedom do you have on software to use on different projects because uh yeah when it comes to team like you if you're working a team there's a pipeline and it will be a bit like different per project based on who's leading or like the artist and stuff. Because some studio are very standardized and sounds like you guys have a lot of freedom in this. Yeah, um, that's a good point. <laughs> um, we, yeah, I mean, we're, like I said, we're really adaptable. Um, we support a lot of different software. I mean, there are things we say no to, but um, it really, again, comes down to the project, um, who's going to be leading it and what they're comfortable with and who's available to work on it. Some of us love, you know, for example, working in Houdini, and um, but we also know that there aren't that many artists who do know how to use it. It sometimes can be intimidating. We don't like have a ton of licenses for it, so it really we keep that to like smaller projects when the people involved are, um, you know, know how to do it and and wouldn't have to like share it around with too many different other artists. But um, yeah, it comes down to the project and. It's sometimes it's like a risk to switch to something mm -hmm. out of our normal pipeline, which I might have mentioned is mostly Maya V-Ray. Um, we do cinema projects as well with Redshift. Um, and, but yeah, it can be a risk to decide to use something that's a little outside of the pipeline. Uh, and so we tend to make those decisions. Um, yeah, for smaller projects we might use uh, something like Houdini. Um, if it's just like 
an individual's contribution to something, like maybe they're model they want to do like procedural modeling or something, um, will you know open it up to the artist to use something like Houdini or Blender or whatever if they want if that's the way they want to create um, something like pasta or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but generally for our character stuff, because character stuff is expensive and complex, we stick to a pretty uh, strict pipeline, uh, which is, yeah, Maya. Yeah. I think like small projects is where um, we try to be more experimental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like the, the, the food project, I, I was one of the three LookDev artists, and the other two were just working on environments. So I was the only like food LookDev person. So I, I was able to just kind of, because I know I don't have to pass my work to anyone else, then I can kind of just decide where I want to work. And sometimes like, we see good reason to like, encourage people to try you know, new stuff out, because we think this might be beneficial in the future. Like, our department used to not know how to open up C40 like, at all. Like, <laughs> It's like, what is C40? Like, <laughs> Maya is the best thing, right? And then yeah. Houdini is like the <laughs> second best thing. But, uh, just kidding, Houdini is best. Uh, but our department like, used to not know how to use C40. Like, we would have 3D designers who are usually like freelancers who would you know, do their magic uh, with motions in C40. And then we would try to like, just catch that out and then bring it back to Maya where we were comfortable working in. But then we start like, uh, putting people just like one by one on like c d projects. And then I start like learning c d Chloe now knows how to use c d And Alfonso, I don't know. Nope. No. <laughs> You're next. It's not for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, now you kind of like bring the average like skill level of the whole department up by just doing it, you know, 1% at a time. But it's a year long project to get the department up to that point. But mm -hmm. All right, y'all, I have uh, some questions from stream for you here. Um, you've kind of touched on this a little bit about the projects that you've been working on and them being small teams, but someone asked specifically, how many people worked on the projects mentioned? <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have to reach into the depths of our memory for that one. Um, <laughs> what is that? Yeah, okay, so starting with, um, starting with the Bonnie one, for a Bonnie one, like the food, like the 30 second spot one, um, there are different departments that contribute to the project, obviously. There's a whole like design department who's working on concept arts for us. And I don't think I'm comfortable like, speaking for them because I, I only work with like two artists, but there's like a lot of people behind the scene. So um, there's design department who's kind of like staffing, you know, their own team. Um, and then there's 3D. For that 30 second spot, um, I, th I think we worked on it for about a month and a half. Um, I remember working with three other modelers. So they developed you know, the environment. And then, as I said before, three looked at artists. I was working on the modeling for the food you know, and the looked at for the food. And the other two was focusing on environments. But it's a little hard to answer because, you know, people don't just stay on the project the whole time. So we, you know, there's like phases of the project. So we might, you know, staff modeling with four people. And then after two weeks, two of them drop out because at that point we just don't have a lot of work. And then, you know, shading will start. So it's not like such a clear cut. Uh, that's why it's like a pretty hard to answer. Um, and sometimes we like try to front load a project if we know, you know there's things that we can just get out of the way very quickly, like just front load with like six modelers just to get all the assets done. And then we can like focus on the other stuff. Um, and then I don't know, do, do you remember on uh, League of Legends? For League of Legends, I remember there were like four to five people on the 3D uh, just for lighting and compositing. And then there's one person who is handling the VFX for uh, some like uh, explosion and stuff. And we also have some 2D elements that is uh, painted by the 2D department, 
but I'm not so, I'm not so sure how many people touched on that. Um, and how many I, animators? Yeah, and then there are like about like four or five. Yeah, yeah, about that kind of number of animators who did the shots. Um, let me think. I don't I don't remember if we have design for this job. I don't think we have design. Yeah, we don't we don't have design for this job because we were getting reference. Yeah, yeah, because we were like client, we yeah. what we want to get is just to integrate it with the live action footage and also we have references f uh, from the trailers. So in this particular job, uh, there is no designers involved. Yeah, that yeah. was a real one. Yeah, that's I, like I think yeah, that's like a a very rare one without designer. Our three yeah. supervisor was like literally the creative director on that yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. For <laughs> Which that, is usually like the two different yeah. roles. For that one and a half minute shot, uh, our supervisor basically single handed that shot, and the comp was like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't for, me. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, for Broly Days, uh, well, at Bug, the CG team is like fairly uh, small. And we usually consider like animation and like three animation and rigging like a separate department because of their uh, personalities. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you take them into account, like all like rigor animation, yeah. lighting, compositing, modelers, and considering that we're all like you know wearing different hats at certain points, uh, I would say it's less than 25 people, maybe like around uh, 20. That's my educated guess. I. I wouldn't be able to say like a number for sure. And as Kian said, like maybe like some artist was like available that only participated with like one character or something like that. Uh, so it was like pretty quick. Uh, but yeah, altogether I would say like 20 to 25. Yeah, like it's it's very rare that I'm in the room. Whenever I have like 3D dailies with my team, it's very rare that the meeting gets over like you know seven or eight people. So that's kind of like the average of our team sides kind of throughout the year. But then, you know, um, once in a while we get these like really big projects where there'll be like 40 people in the call <laughs> and no one is talking. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a pretty small team, like yeah. generally. Generally, yeah, yeah we, we work with fairly small teams. And then uh, one for you specifically, Mark. How has being self-taught informed the way you work and your professional development? Oh, man. Um, well, uh, I think that I had like a lot of imposter syndrome, syndrome for a long time where I thought like I was just like, I never really learned how to do things properly. Um, but I don't know, I over time kind of like lost that um, and I feel mm -hmm. like some I sometimes know what I'm doing, <laughs> um, but how has it affected? Um, I mean, I, there's a lot of, it, it, I think it allowed me to, my experience allowed me to like pick up on a lot of like the different, you know, departments in our process and how things work. I worked in visual effects for a while too, so I understand how like live action stuff works, how filmmaking works on set and those sorts of things. I think those all contributed to like a, a good picture of like um, the process. Um, which helps me in my supervisor role, but there are, there are specific things that I like never really learned. Like, I'm, no one would ever ask me to model or UV something at Buck. No one would ever ask me to, to rig something because they know I have no idea how to do that. I mean, I did it one time, but it was painful. Um, so there are definitely gaps in my knowledge, and I'm just, I just, these days, as opposed to feeling like insufficient or like I'm not good enough, I just, you know, I consider it like, you know, just an opportunity to rely on like the talented people around me to help fill in the gaps. Um, when I, you know, when I don't understand something, I'm just honest and I, I'm like, I have no idea. Let's, let me ask somebody who does know. Um, so, yeah, it took a bit of time to get over that, but, um, you know, it helps when, you know, the vibe with my team is very non judgmental and I feel like everyone's pretty honest about what they can and can't do. Um, and uh, hopefully that answers your question. I don't know. <laughs> or is that from the stream? Um, I, I also have a question. It's like, I'm a student here. I'm here to learn new skills. And my question yeah. will be, how do you guys learn skills when you guys at job? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, yeah. from the watermelon to the pasta, you know, like, what happened? How did you improve so <laughs> much? <laughs> you know? Is it more like 
finding documentation on yourself and um, or like mentoring from uh, colleagues? Okay, yeah. So the quick question is like, you just stop <laughs> sleeping, <laughs> and then <laughs> then you have like double hours to work on whatever. No, but <laughs> um, as I said before, like small project is usually where we want to be really experimental and. I know it's like really hard to find time for it. It's just like learn tools on the job, but those small project is like the best opportunity to, to do that. And um, for, for me specifically, like you were asking about the watermelon to the pasta, um, I, during my first six months at Buck, I just had a little bit of downtime. <laughs> um, I was new to the project, like no one were like quite sure what I was good at. So I had like a couple of weeks like here and there that I was like, wasn't on a project. And um, that's where the procedural burger <laughs> was made. Um, it was like, yeah, two weeks of like trying to like do this crazy thing, like try to like impress as many people as I could. Um, and then, yeah, you know, who knows? Like from that two week, it turned into like a whole journey of me like you know, diving into procedural texturing and start picking up. Like at that point, like looking at that like crazy burger, I was like, <laughs> is there any, any other thing that I can learn to sort of make this thing more efficient? And then I picked up Substance Designers because it was just made for that. And to echo what Mark said, like my hypergraph is like the worst thing on earth <laughs> for like making complicated um, cheddar. Half the time it just crash. You lose everything and you <laughs> cry. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, li I like to say that we, we do, um, we make time for people to learn when it's possible. Like if somebody has downtime, if they're not assigned to a project, we'll talk to them about what they're interested in learning or we'll suggest something that they might interest, be interested in and we'll kind of allow them to have that time to, you know, to do things. I think we, we offer like, you know, I think we offered Nomon classes actually um, this year, yeah. which is cool. Like some of our artists took classes um, from here and loved it. So uh, we try to keep continuing learning and education like a part of our culture. Um, and a lot of times we're really busy and you're learning just by being on the job and maybe somebody asks some, you to do something outside of your comfort zone. And sometimes we have time to actually do it like the more traditional way. Yeah. Um. For, for me, I think like I started uh, as a modeler, so I was doing a lot of personal pro projects that were just modeling. So that's how I like became good at it, and I was only exploring the neighboring areas like just a little bit. But then, thanks to that, I was able to land you know my first jobs. And it's like when you're in the office with other like experts that you start um, having more access to information and more access to feedback, and. I, you know, it's also a little bit of trying to find the time to do personal projects in which you can apply whatever you want to learn and just keep like asking for feedback uh, with the person that you know knows a little bit more than you do. And it's never like, uh, well, for starters, like when we say we're generalists, like probably we don't rig and we don't, you know, animate and stuff like that. It's, it's more like a, you know, set of skills, it's not all of them. And they also don't come like all at once. Like I think I started developing like the, you know, texturing and, and look dev like throughout like my first year on Buck and then a little bit more of lighting and compositing. So it, it doesn't have to come all at once. I would say like try to do personal projects. Like if, if you don't have a job yet, like try to do personal projects and, uh, you know, decide one discipline that you want to like explore gather like a lot of references or even like gather files of people who have like successfully done it and just like study it as much as you can and basically like try to replicate what your heroes do because that's like the best way like to learn. Yeah. To like echo that part just a little bit, um, if you think about it, every software you use, you probably use like 20% of the tools for like 80% of the work. So. Learning a software doesn't mean you have to like be at the advanced level. And for me, like I picked up Houdini, you know, when I started at Buck. And I still don't know how to do volume scene. Like no not everyone needs to know that. Like all I need to know is how to pass, you know, 
vertex color data into my Alembic cache so that I can bring it to Maya. And knowing just that, just elevate my whole workflow like tens level. Because now I can like start thinking about ideas that wasn't, you know, available to me in, in just Maya. So yeah, like you don't you might just have to learn, you know, a couple of tools and tricks that are relevant to you know what you're interested in. But don't don't be like intimidated by you know the larger picture because no one knows like every single tool in Houdini. Um, yeah. All right, we have two final questions for y'all, starting right here. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for taking the time to just come out tonight and share just a lot of wisdom. Um, it was really cool hearing and watching you guys break things down. And I was just really curious because it sounds like you guys have been in the industry for quite a while. Um, have you seen any trends in your time maybe just working in CG in, in terms of like types of projects or like skills or just like in general with the industry, where it's going, um, if any? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that like working, because Buck is like a very design-centric company and designs go through trends like fashion. So we see a lot of those come and go and some of those are related to like the tools. So like when Vellum came out or something, you suddenly saw a lot more you know, pillows or whatever. Um, <laughs> or when people started picking up Cinema 4D more, you saw all sorts of MoGraph stuff that looked like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, we see lots of trends come and go. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm trying to think, uh, yeah, like for instance, like the Houdini thing, a lot more people have picked that up in the last few years. Um, people are picking up GPU renders. We rely on like a workhorse, you know, V-Ray, but you know, we've also, we're not trying to st be stagnant, so we've taken on um, supporting like Redshift, not Octane, but Redshift. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so we try to adapt and, and move with the, with the industry as well. Um, you know, obviously there's like the elephant in the room of AI, but um, which we are also, you know, keeping an eye on to see how that develops. Um, but yeah, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, because like our clan base is so diverse. Um, we're not really just, you know, working in feature film or VFX. We're working with brands like Meta, Google, and yeah. those are like really design centric. Um, so like the trend is definitely different depending on you know, which industry you're looking at. Um, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, AI is definitely the elephant in the room right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> but that's like a whole talk for another day maybe. <laughs> it's quite a complicated situation. But we, we try to manage um, navigating that internally as well. Yeah. But. Hello. Um, so uh, have you guys or uh, do you guys have a USD pipeline? And if you do, <laughs> have you like thoughts? And if you do not, why? Like, What's the reasoning behind why not? So, um, I'm, I mean, our, our pipeline to you would be the best person to answer this, but I will say, like, Buck is like a start, you know, we're a fairly small company, but we, we've started getting bigger, but, um, like, we, we love new technology and we love adapting and finding what's, like, the coolest, best technology to apply to a project, but we are a company that of, like, a certain size and we do have to, um, you know, integrate things into a fairly complex pipeline. It takes training people, all sorts of reasons um, why we can't just jump into something like as sort of massive as USD right away. So we don't really use it um, in our main pipeline. We are like very much, it's very much on our radar and we're looking at it for like the future. Um, and we have done some work with it, um, ma mainly in Houdini. Um, we have not integrated it into Maya yet, although it does seem pretty cool. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it's definitely on our radar. Yeah. All right. Well, I lied. I actually have one more question for each one of you. Uh, very quickly, let's switch roles for a second. You're out there. You're the same age as these students, and you're looking at yourself and you're about to tell yourself something that you really needed to hear before you started your journey. What's that thing? 
what's that thing that, that you, you have all of this, right? You have all this knowledge, you're about to go into the workforce and everything, and you just need something, you need that push, and you know those words that you need to hear. What, what, what are those? I know this is a thought-provoking one. First of all, it makes you think I'm not the same age as these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Whoever wants to go first? Yeah. 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 I I'll, I'll start with something real quick that I think it really upped my modeling game, which was uh, like very important for me to like land my, like the jobs that I got. And that was stop attempting to model your own characters created by you if you're not like a character designer. I think using someone else's like good design with like better structure or better anatomy gives you so much more to learn than all the things that you like already have. Because if you just like keep trying to model from what you have like in memory or even what you drew, you're only gonna keep like doing the same things that you always do. Uh, so it comes back to like do what your heroes are doing, but also you don't have to do all the steps of the process. Uh, sometimes to learn, you can like pick up what someone else, you know, started, like an idea or a concept, and develop on that. And because that's what happens, you know, in our day to day at work, it's like the characters that I model look good because I didn't design them. Or sometimes, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, if you're an animator, don't make their own rig for your animation because it's not going to look great. So I think. If you start with something that already has like a professional quality, the final product of what you have, it's gonna have a way higher quality and when you're applying to jobs, that like looks way better. Well, I think for me, transitioning from like student to into like a real working place, uh, one of the things that I found really important is that to keep in mind that you are being a team player rather than just like a solo uh, worker. Because for me, I, when I was a student, I only have like one partner for my thesis film. And it doesn't need much like, um, like communicating, it's just two of us. So everything is basically what we think and then we just do it. And uh, when I just start working, I will have this kind of loop that I just start doing stuff and not showing it to anyone until I think it is good to show it. And it's, I feel like it's uh, really time wasting sometimes. And because a lot of times, especially in studios like Buck, things are turning around pretty uh, quickly. And if you're not showing it to like your uh, supervisor or just your coworker to get feedbacks, things will get changed and a lot of things that you have been working on may not be valid anymore. So just like really keep in mind that you are not just working for yourself, you're working within a whole team and that's across different uh, departments. So really communicating more with either your coworker, your superior, uh, uh, people from different departments, like the designers, the 2D animators, because uh, like most of jobs we are working on are like uh, from, are needing a lot of help from different like departments. So yeah, that's, I think that's what I'm trying to, I try to keep, keep in mind uh, all the way until now. Mm. I think I have two things. Um, I remember when it was, I was in school, it was very easy to just kind of navigate inside a small bubble where you just kind of interacting with your, the same classmates all the time, and you're getting feedbacks and, um, you know, I, I, feedbacks from them. And, you know, their classmates, they're like friends, so they're gonna be nice. And, which brings me to the importance of critical feedbacks. Like, someone who is able to be straight with you and tell you when something doesn't look good. And, to me, that was like really important. Like, I, I was lucky to find a person uh, when I was in school that was able to do that for me. Um, but having that someone to tell you when, you know, to basically like push you to be better by telling, you know, what needs to be done. Because we were all student ones, like our work was not the greatest. <laughs> um, 
I thought my work was the way it is, like uh, when I was in school, but turned out, you know, it was not, um, and there's always room for improvement. Um, and the other thing is broadening your kind of employer like horizon. Because when I was in school, it was like an animation, you know, program. And I remember doing like a first year, you know, going to orientation. It was kind of like implanted in my mind that Pixar and Disney were like the goal. And for the many years of being in school, that turned out to be my goal too. Like I, I thought that was like the, only, the, the dream place, like the only place I could be. But then when I you know, was about to get out of school and applying for jobs, I'm on a visa. So I don't really have that, you know, um, privilege of just apply for the thing that I want. Um, I really had to apply to anything that I could find. <laughs> um, so, frankly, I didn't know about Buck <laughs> during all of my years in college. I only found out about them when I was searching for a job, you know, six months before I graduated. And it turned out to be the best decision I've ever made in my life. And yeah, so look out there. Your skill set might be applicable in a lot of different fields and a lot of different employers. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's well said. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think, I think um, I'll just leave you with something very practical, which is every once in a while, flip your shot horizontally. <laughs> and take, a look at it. <laughs> take a look at it and write down everything you don't like about it, and then flip it back, and uh, yeah. I, I guarantee you, like, this is the, when I discovered this, it was like the greatest thing I ever learned. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Don't overdo it, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that note, uh, thank you to Buck. Thank you so much for coming out here. That was extremely fun. I, I really appreciate you all being here and sharing your wisdom. If you're here, they, they agreed to stay a little bit after so you can chat with them a little bit. You at home, though, uh, you cannot chat through the screen, but you can check out what Noman can do for you at www.noman.edu. You can also check us out on our socials at Noman School so you can see when we're going to be doing other live streams. And that's it. Have a great night, everyone, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>